So like the video said, we are kicking off week two of our Holy Spirit series. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about partnering with the Holy Spirit. And so I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Luke 24. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We'll have it up on the screens for you. It's no problem. But as you're turning, this whole notion of partnering with the Holy Spirit, I love what Pastor Mark said last week about the Holy Spirit being a person. See, sometimes we think of it as an energy or a force, but when we understand it as a person, it changes our perspective, really. It changes the way we see him, the way we view things, the way we walk with him and talk with him. I think it can really change everything. And as such, church, we have a calling, an opportunity, a privilege, but a calling to partner with the Holy Spirit in God's mission. And I love that. I love that God would choose to use broken, messy people like me like most of us in this room. I won't say you're broken and messy, but I'll say I am. But we, get, we have the privilege to partner with the Holy Spirit. So let's look at what Jesus said in Luke 24 to, to kick this thing off. Starting in verse 45. It says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of, the, of his name, to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Church, what Jesus was talking about was an incredible opportunity to partner with what he was doing, to partner with his mission, to partner with the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll send it. But see, if we're going to partner with the Holy Spirit, we have to understand what we're partnering for. And I think Jesus tells us in these verses we just read, and it's very simple. Uh, Rarely does God make things incredibly complicated for us. Jesus' mission, God's mission, is people. That's his mission. It's me. It's you. It's people who have never been in this church, people who have grown up in this church, people who have never walked through the doors of a church anywhere, the broken, the lost, the hurting, the ones who have it all together, if those people really exist. It's for all of us. It's for people. That's God's mission. And what I love about that verse we just read is Jesus explains the mission. He said, hey, guess what? You're the witnesses. Now tag, you're it. He calls the disciple and he says, tag, it's your turn. Go tell somebody. We get to partner with that. And Paul sums it up so well in 2 Corinthians. Check this out. It said, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful gift, wonderful message, rather, of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be offering, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made with right with God through Christ. Can you say amen to that? From cover to cover, God's word is telling a story of him redeeming his people to himself. That's his mission, church. That's God's mission from cover to cover. And listen, if God's biggest priority is people, it has to be mine too. That has to be my priority. Listen, if I'm going to claim that I'm Christ-like, I have to be like Christ. Well, that's redundant, absolutely. But so many times I fail to live up to that, personally. I have to be about God's mission. And so listen, if God's mission is people... Then the next logical question is how can we partner with the Holy Spirit in God's mission? How can we partner with the Holy Spirit in God's mission? Listen, have you ever heard parents, or maybe you're the parents who have said this, and if so, don't corner me after service, but have have you ever heard the phrase, because I said so, that's why? Have you ever said that phrase? You don't have to raise your hands. My mom would say that to me, and as a kid, I had to like, I was an arguer. Like, I didn't care if I was right or wrong. I just had to win. I felt that I had to win. I never did, and it was disrespectful, to be completely honest. But my mom would get to a point where I would say, why, 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 why? So many times, she's like, because I said so. That's why, and that's enough. 
Well, she was right, and that's true. But listen, I think God approaches things a little bit differently. And I'm not saying that against my mom or you if you've ever said that. I'm not saying you're not approaching it godly. That's enough for, for your children. But, but what I love about God is, see, he says, this is your mission. In the Great Commission, Jesus said what? Go into all the world. So Jesus said, go. But what I love about it is he showed us how to do it. And after he showed us how to do it, he went another step fur further and he said, listen, I'm going to send somebody to help you do it now. It doesn't become a because I said so matter, although if it was because God said so, how many would say that's enough? But see, he went a step further and he said, let me show you how to do it and then let me help you do it. See, we see in the word that the Holy Spirit was sent so that we wouldn't be left helpless. Helpless. We're not. We're not orphans. We're not helpless. We have somebody with us. So today, I want to share three ways that we can partner with the Holy Spirit in God's mission. And listen, these aren't incredibly complicated. God doesn't make his mission complicated because if he did, I would be in a world of trouble. I don't do complicated very well. I'm a pretty simple guy. And I think God made his word simple to follow. So three ways we can partner with the Holy Spirit. And the first way is this. Led by the Holy Spirit. So profound, isn't it? Hey, listen, this might not be a difficult concept, but how many of you agree that sometimes it's difficult to walk out? I'll raise both hands for that one. Be led by the Holy Spirit. See, to be led, we have to be in tune to hear the Holy Spirit. That's the challenge, being in tune to hear the Holy Spirit. Here's a, a statistic. That's a hard word to say. A statistic I found preparing for this message. It said the average person, each one of us sitting in this room, in our lifetime will meet 80,000 people. That's a whole lot of people. Now, that's not saying you have 80,000 friends. I would love that. But it's saying that we'll meet 80,000 people in a lifetime. How many of these people do you think the Holy Spirit is prompting you to share life with? We could, we could really split hairs and say, well, from the time I was like zero to ten, I was meeting people but never knew what I was doing, so that doesn't count. And, well, I kind of walked away from God when I was, you know, 18 to like 24, so that doesn't count either. We can split hairs all day long, but I think the answer comes down to how many of those people would God love us to share life with? Every one of them. Every one of them. But I think the question is how many times do we hear the Holy Spirit leading us? How many times are we in tune to hear that? That's the question. I know mine isn't, I can't say 80,000 for my answer. There's no way. Church, how many people, and this is going to me too, how many people walk right in front of my face on a daily basis and I never say a word? Too many for me personally. That answer is too many. Sometimes I get busy. Sometimes I get wrapped up in things. Sometimes I'm just self-centered. I know no one else here struggles with being self-centered. Sometimes I'm just self-centered and I don't want to do it. But how many people cross our face daily? See, it's not a matter of if the Holy Spirit is leading us to reach people. It's a matter of if we're hearing him loud and clear, if we're being led by the Spirit. Check out what Paul writes to the Galatian church, and this is so good. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In some of our lives, in some areas, in every part, in every day. Church, if you read anything Paul has ever written, you know that he doesn't really mix up words a whole lot. He's pretty, he's pretty straight out there and straightforward, and I love that about him. He says, nail your sinful passions and desires to the cross. I think Paul's onto something here. I think what he's saying is, he's talking about sin, yes, but, but these things are distractions, ultimately. These desires, these passions, they, become, they can become distractions if we're not careful. Even ones that aren't sinful. If we're not careful, they can become distractions. And they can drown out the voice of the Holy Spirit. How about sometimes, if you ever see, we can pick on teenagers, and we like to, but I think adults are just as guilty. You see people sitting in a room and they're all, they're all texting. I'm guilty, I do it. Or they're playing a game or there's something. We, we like to pick on teenagers, but I think we're all guilty of it, really. 
or, or, or some of us, I'll say. Don't throw stones. But what if we could put that away when we're in that room and talk to people? We'd really hear something and learn something, wouldn't we? It's the same with the Holy Spirit. If we could put down our distractions, we could really hear something and learn something. Social media, sin, you name it. What is our distraction? Because if that's there, chances are we're not hearing the Holy Spirit plainly and we're probably missing something. See, I guarantee that if we could put down our distractions, church, and be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we would probably be blown away by what God really shows us. Think about it. If, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, do you think he only talks to us sometimes? Probably not. Do you think he only speaks up on a rare occasion once in a while? Nah. Sometimes it seems like it. But I would be willing to bet if we could take a bird's eye view of the situation, we'd find that the Holy Spirit is constantly talking. We're rarely listening. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Because that's an ouch for me. I think we find that the Holy Spirit is constantly talking. I'm rarely, or not often enough, listening. But like Paul said, we have to follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every area of our life, not just some. Not just some. We'll get more on that later. So number two, we need to be helped by the Holy Spirit. Helped by the Holy Spirit. Listen, if we're, if we're being led great and you're hearing every word the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you try to do it on your own, you are going to fall and you're going to fall fast. We're going to fail and we're going to fail fast. We can't do it on our own strength. We're going to get nowhere very fast. And I've, I can think of times when the Holy Spirit, when I felt the tug, felt the, the, your heart start beating 100 miles an hour, you know? And it's like, well, God, what if I get over there and I don't know what to say? Or what if I sound stupid? Or, or what if I freeze? Or what if they think I'm nuts and I'm crazy? That's partially because I am. But what if they think that? What if, what if, what if I get there and I just am like, uh, Jesus loves you, see you later. And we're out. What if I'm not qualified? I think that often. God, there's no way I can approach them about this because... How am I qualified to speak into this person's life? How am I qualified? I'm a knucklehead. I've blown it so many times, it's ridiculous. That's where we need to focus on the Holy Spirit as our helper because if we try to do it by ourselves, it's not enough. And we're not going to be able to do it. We're not qualified. But if we under, understand the Holy Spirit as our helper, we've got everything we need, church. Jesus said when he left, he wasn't going to leave us alone and helpless. That's such good news. And I think sometimes that doesn't sink in far enough for me. It's such good news. The thing is, is we have to actually let the Holy Spirit help us, which is twofold. We have to actually step into a place where we can't do it on our own, which is terrifying sometimes. Sometimes we just like to stay back where it's comfy cozy and we know, we're, we know we got it we're on autopilot. I can handle this. We have to step out to a place where we have to rely on God's help. Then we have to be willing to allow him to do it, because so many times, for me, I like to control things, and if it's out of my control, I freak out a little bit, but I have to be willing to let God and the Holy Spirit help me. Look at what Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive what? Power. We know this verse. A lot of us in this place know this, know this verse, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is our mission and outreach key verse. That's our missions and outreach key verse. But listen, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And when he gives us power, see so many times, we, we stop right there. But when the Holy Spirit gives us power, it's for action. We forget to, we forget to continue the sentence. We put a period. You will receive power, period. Yes, but we forget the rest of that. And see, listen, as with a Pentecostal background, we have to be a little careful, church, because we love the power. Can I get an amen? We love the power. But, yeah, see, we love it. But see, here's the thing. If we're not careful, we want the Acts 2 experience, and there is nothing wrong with that. Hear me loud and very clear. There is nothing wrong with wanting the power of the Holy Spirit. But, but I think what the danger is is that sometimes we read Acts 2 and we're like, yes, it came on them with power. They spoke in tongues. And then we forget to read the rest of what happens. 
Because see, if you read even further in Acts, 32, or in Acts 8, past verse 32, if you read even further in Acts 2, and you read the rest of the chapter of Acts, when they received that power, they moved into action. Peter, in that very same chapter, uses the power of the Holy Spirit to reach thousands of people's lives. And throughout the rest of Acts, it's the church in action through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't forget to read further in that chapter, church. As believers, we can't hope to come on Sunday morning, Lord, give me the power. There's nothing wrong with that. But then Monday through Saturday, we're sitting at home. We come to Sunday, Lord, give me the power. And then we sit at home. That's not what, we're abusing that because that's, if you look in Scripture, when people received the power of the Holy Spirit, they were moved into action and they did something. We receive the power for a purpose. And it's a very, very important purpose, church. The power of the Holy Spirit is our help. And it's the power to step out. And listen, here's some encouragement. If we look at John 14, it says, But the helper will teach you everything and will cause you to remember all that I told you. This helper is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. And it's important to mention that in that context, they're talking about when the church is being persecuted. But listen, if the Holy Spirit is the helper and will remind us of what we need to say in those moments, I have to believe he's going to do it in our moments when we're sharing his life with somebody. Amen? He's going to help us. Listen, when you're in those moments and you feel the Holy Spirit, maybe this is something that's difficult for you or maybe you're a seasoned veteran and you're like, I've got this down. That's okay. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And when you feel the tug to go talk to somebody, when you feel the tug to be partnering with God's mission, he's going to help you. He's going to, according to this scripture, give you the words you need to say. That's the biggest part of the battle when I feel the Holy Spirit. What am I going to say, God? I got this. That's what he's saying. I love what that says. He's going to teach us everything we need. It goes, back to, it goes back to he told us, he showed us, and now he's going to help us. We can trust in that. Look at what Hebrews 13 says. Now may the God of peace, bumping on to, to verse 21, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he equip us for everything good for doing his will. That thing you need, he's going to help you get it. He's going to give it to you when you need it. See, when we step out, we have to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to help us. Or the problem is, we're never going to step out in the first place. If we don't trust it, if we don't take him at his word, we'll never step out in the first place. Well, what about, what if, what if I don't know what to say? What if, what if I this? What if I that? What if I freeze? What if I, what if I, what if I, what if I? Church, what if God's already thought of all that? What if when he put that tug on your heart, he knew exactly what you were going to struggle with? But what if I'm not qualified? Well, what if God already knew that you had the qualification and that's why he stirred your heart to do it? What if God's already taken care of it? See, so many times we get drowned by the what ifs and the fear that we forget. Well, what if God's already taken care of it? Because according to his word, he has. So we need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be helped by the Spirit. And number three, is we need to be one with the Holy Spirit. And listen, I know what this sounds like. You've got to be one with the Spirit. And I can assure you this is not what I'm talking about. I know be one with the Spirit. Be one with the force. Yoda was a great guy. He could do like 30 spinning backflips and kick the whole bunch of tail and was awesome. No offense to Yoda, but that's not what I'm talking about by being one with the Spirit. See, what Pastor Mark said last week was so huge. We can't view the Holy Spirit as a force. We have to view it as a person. And when we're one with a person, it changes things. It changes things. So what I'm talking about is being one. I'm talking about oneness with the Holy Spirit. And if you, if you read, and, and it won't be on the screen, but if you read later in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says... I consider everything else as garbage compared to knowing Christ and being one with him. Everything else I consider garbage compared to being one with him. Paul was on to something. Paul was on to something. See, see, what we do is oftentimes we compartmentalize this whole idea of being one with the Spirit. 
we compartmentalize. And I want to share um, a conversation I had one time. And it was just recently, actually, and it really kind of inspired this message. The Holy Spirit prompted me, and I, and I started thinking. Um, I was actually talking to a funeral director. I know that's kind of a grim start to the story, but um, I was talking to a funeral director, and um, he was sharing his heart about the, uh, the actual funeral service. And I understand where the guy was coming from, and I mean absolutely zero offense to him when I say that I completely disagree with what he said. And his statement was this. He said, you know, oftentimes when we, when we do a funeral, we celebrate the person's life all together as one. When in actuality, we should celebrate them as two separate things that they really are. He said we should celebrate on one side. We should celebrate their life. We should celebrate their hobbies, their what they like to do, their family, their, what they were good at, their interests. We should celebrate all that. And then on the other side, we should celebrate their faith. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit prompted my heart. I was like, man, I love you, and I mean no disrespect. And I didn't say this to the guy, but I completely disagree and couldn't disagree more with what you're saying because when I look at Scripture, that's not how it's portrayed. When I look at Scripture, it's about being one with God. Anytime I look at scripture, it's about being united with Christ, being one with the Holy Spirit. And you know, so oftentimes we compartmentalize things. And we have like, well, this is my hobbies, this is me, this is my family, this is my work, what I do, um, this is all my me stuff, and then I have, I have my faith, I have my God stuff. And we keep them in two separate jars. And listen, please don't hear what I'm saying or hear this message as as beating anybody down, listen, if you are doing this, please, by all means, keep doing it. If you've got it figured out, then please keep it and run with it and help others. But sometimes, church, I feel like we need reminded and encouraged because actually just this week, God challenged me with this exact idea. See, working at the church with Hannah and I both, it's been, it's been a bit of a learning curve. We've been in ministry for about three years now. And um, when you work... A not church job, man, when I would, with four o'clock, I would forget that place ever existed. Anybody else love to do that? Like, I could really turn it off. It wasn't there until eight o'clock the next morning. And so when, when Han and I go home, we try to, like, I have, it's, it's healthy for us. Please don't miss my heart in this. At some point when there's nothing going on, we have to be able to unplug and, and disconnect a little bit from, from church life because it can very, very easily consume every minute of every day. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? And this isn't a pity party. I'm using this. Please don't take it that way. I'm using this as an example. So, so what had happened was I started contending, like, okay, when we're home, we're turning it off. When we're home, we're, we're, we're unplugging, we're relaxing so that we can stay healthy. But here's what I did, church. I did this. I compartmentalized. See, when I wasn't at church, I was this. The problem with that, my neighbors, they need this. That's the problem. They don't need this. They need this, but they need this too. And I wasn't giving them that because I was turning it off. I was compartmentalizing. Really, church, what we're called to do, what I see in scriptures, what my neighbor needs, is this. Church, we're called to live orange. We're not called to be red. We're not called to be just yellow. Well, what do you mean we're not called to be just yellow? Listen, here's what I mean by that. If we're just yellow, we miss this very important thing that God created us to be. He created us naturally. And through the Holy Spirit, we can live supernaturally. It takes both, church. This, we can't knock this thing. This, yeah, a lot of times we say, well, that's the flesh. We need to crucify that, and we do. But this is how God wired us instinctively for the exact purpose he created us for. This is a good thing when mixed with this thing. Orange is good, church. My neighbors need orange. They don't need me taking time off because here's the thing. The mission of God, it doesn't have any days off, church. It's not a part-time job. It's not even a full-time job in the context that we understand full-time. It is all the time. The mission of God is all the time. It's not compartmentalized. 
See, the fact of the matter is when we live orange, when we allow this to mix with this, the Holy Spirit gets ingrained into every fiber of who we are. Every single fiber of who we are, the Holy Spirit gets ingrained in. That's the way we're supposed to live, naturally, supernatural. Look at what Romans 8 says. I love this. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fear, fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. Listen to this. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. There's no two things. It doesn't say it. His spirit partners with our spirit and we stay us. He says it joins with. It joins with. It's not a, it's not a two thing. God's spirit with ours, that's incredible, church. That is incredible. Living orange is incredible. Like we said earlier, when Paul wrote to Philippians, he said, I count it all garbage compared to being one with Christ. Nothing even comes close. So to recap real quick, if we want to partner with the Holy Spirit in God's mission, number one, be led by the Holy Spirit. Number two, be helped by the Holy Spirit. And number three, be one with the Holy Spirit. Church, I'd like to issue us a challenge today. God didn't make it difficult. It's really this simple. Church, let's live orange. Let's live orange. Don't compartmentalize. I share God's challenge for me this week. We all have them. Listen, this isn't a one-time thing. Like, oh, I dumped it together. I'm orange forever now. Well, see, if we're not careful, what happens is this. And then Sunday morning comes, and we're like, I'm good. Going to church today. Putting on my Sunday best, and I'm going to church. And listen, there's nothing wrong with putting on your Sunday best. This, this is the problem. It's a constant tug of war of who's leading and who's winning, when in all reality... It's that. Are you tracking with me? It's this. This is how we partner with God. This is how we live missional lives. See, I want to share something with you from my heart. I heard, um, I heard this statement about the church. And <laughs> the statement really bothered me. Because, listen, there's a bunch of stuff out there about the Americanized church, if we're doing it right, if we're doing it wrong, blah, 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 blah. Here's what I know. In our church last year, almost 200 people came to know Christ. We're doing something right. It's not us. It's the Holy Spirit. That's what's right. And so this isn't a matter of, of right or wrong in the church, but I heard this statement, and it stuck with me, and it challenged my thinking because the statement was simply this. In our culture today, in America, people see the church as one of two things, or both. This is how the general people view the church, and I, I've been guilty of this myself. Number one, we view the church as a place to go where things happen. It's the event-driven mentality. Well, I need to go to church. Are we going to have this event? Are we going to do this thing? Are we going to have this thing for the kids? Are we going to have that? Are we going to have this and that? And listen, I'm not saying that's bad. Please hear me loud and clear. I'm not saying this is bad. So people view the church as a place where things happen, the event mentality, or they view the church as a vendor of religious goods and services. Now, religious goods and services, that's not a bad thing. The problem I have is the word vendor. That's not okay, church. Generally speaking, people view the church as event-driven, a place where things happen, or, a, or a, a vendor of goods and services. And here's the thing. I think when we're looking through this scope, even as church folk, if you will, I think it's very true. I think it's very true. That's a bold statement. I think it's very true that we only are a place where events happen and a vendor of goods and services when we see the church through this lens. Here's why. When we see through red and yellow, church is a place we go. 
when we see through orange, we are the church. Here's the thing, church. Jesus isn't coming back for this building. We can make it as pretty as we want. We can make it as modern or traditional or we can change the carpet. We can change the backdrop. We can add lights. We can do all these things. And at the end of the day, these walls are going to crumble one day. That's the truth of it. One day this building is going to be old and fall apart. That's the truth of the matter. Jesus isn't coming back for this building. And so many times we look through red and yellow as like, well, I have to go to church today, so I put out my yellow. I put out yellow because I'm going to church. Well, that's our first mistake. We are the church. How can we go to, where we're, to what we're supposed to be? When we see through orange, we are the church. Red and yellow says it's a place we go to get things, the church. Orange says that's my identity. It goes deep. I love this one the most. Red and yellow, we'll sit back and pray, God, please bring people through those doors. And there's nothing wrong with that prayer, church. We should be praying that. But red and yellow stops there. Orange says, I'm going to go get them. That's the difference. I'm going to go get them. And we're still going to pray that they come through those doors. But I'm going to go get them. Because the reality is, when Jesus said go, that means we were sent. When we pray send, that means we're staying. Do you get that? When Jesus said to go, that meant we, that meant we were sent. When we pray God send, that means we're staying. Do you see the contrast? Jesus didn't say, hey, stay, and I'll send people your way. I'll bring them all to you. He said, go into the world. Go reach people. What if we didn't just pick up yellow on Sunday, but it's who we were Monday through Saturday? What if orange is who we were, rather, I'm sorry. What if we didn't just pick this up when we're feeling godly, when we have small group or when we go to church, but what if this is what we took every day of our lives? What if this was who we are when we went to work and not this? Do you think your workplace might look a little different? And church, if you are doing it, please keep doing it. I just simply want to share with you what I've been challenged with. This isn't a beat you over the head thing. This is a, hey, here's my heart. This is my heart as plain and clear and transparent as it can be. See, listen, here's a question I want to ask you. It's a bold question. And if you don't like it, it's okay, but please hear the heart of it. Hear the heart of this question and don't miss it. What if church wasn't just a place we went to be fed and grow? What are you talking about? Listen, what if it wasn't just because getting fed and growing are great things and we have a great pastor who does that every week. But what if our thought of church wasn't, I need to go get fed today so I can grow. But what if our thought was, what if I go... I need to go get equipped today so that I can go reach people. What if that was our thought, church? And some of you that may be, but what if as a whole, as over 600 people, that was our unified cry and our unified objective. Let's go get fed and grow and let's go get equipped so that we can go reach people. What if at, what if at 1030, when service is over, you shake hands, you give hugs, you chat a bit, and what if our church busted out those doors, determined to share the love of Christ with somebody? What if when you go to lunch today after church, you pray with your waitress or waiter? What if you ask them if you can pray with them? What if you share the love of Christ with them? What if we were that deliberate and intentional? And if you are, please keep doing it and have patience with the rest of us while we catch up. But what if as a whole body, we had one voice, and that was it. Church, listen, I'm not standing here as somebody who's got it all together. I struggle with this thing every day. I struggle with being orange every day. I don't have it together. I don't have it figured out. I would say that's probably most of us in here. But here's what I am standing before you saying, is that I'm all in. I'm declaring that today. I'm all in. 
I'm all in because there's people out those doors in our backyard who are broken, who struggle with addictions, who've never met Christ, who've never encountered his love. There's people in this church feeling that same way. I'm all in. I'm not going to get it right. But if I can partner with the Holy Spirit, I might be able to do something. That's what God's looking for, a few good men, a few good women who would say, I'm in. So I just want to share a final thought. If we can live Orange Church, the potential is unlimited. It's unlimited. And it's exponential, the impact that could be made. If it was who you are, Sunday to Sunday, and I'm not saying it's not. Please hear that. I can't, I can't stress that enough. I'm not saying that you're not living that. I just want to encourage you to keep on if you are. But church, if it was who we are every day of the week, there would have, there must be, according to the word, there would have to be a change in our world. There would have to be. How could there not be? When Jesus came, was the world not changed? Jesus is still here. Can the world not be changed? Man, I sound like I'm on a soapbox. Sorry. (laughs) But guys, this is my heart, man. What's holding you back? Is it fear? Because the Holy Spirit's our helper. Are you not hearing? Because he's there to lead us. Are you living red or living yellow? Because we can be one with the Holy Spirit and live orange, and make a difference. Are you with me? Amen. Man, if this message has, has encouraged your heart, listen, here's your next step. We have, we have small groups that do outreach regularly. There's plenty of organizations in this community. We have mission trips coming up. There are plenty of ways to get involved. Or how about this? We don't have to make it complicated. You don't have to wait for a church event. Invite your neighbor over for dinner. Church, that's where this whole thing started from, to be completely honest. In November of last year, somebody said to me that they started having cornbread for their community, and they invited everyone over, and they got to know all their neighbors. That simple. And I'm like, that's what I need to do. That's what I want to do. And can I confess that I've still not had my neighbors over for dinner? I'll admit it. Why? There's no good reason why. I just haven't, and I need to. But it can be that simple of inviting your neighbors over for dinner. It's living intentionally, partnering with the Holy Spirit for God's mission.